Uh, here's a, a puzzle. Uh, why uh, did 43% of Democratic Party caucus goers in Iowa on in early February, when asked, uh, say that they regarded themselves as socialists? Uh, this uh, was not expected. Uh, and this was a result of a public opinion survey by an old, very highly respected public opinion survey company in Iowa, Seltzer and Company. Uh, since uh, the spring of uh, 2009 in the U.S., uh, public opinion surveys by the mainstream polling companies uh, have consistently found that between 35% and 45% of young people uh, view socialism, whatever they think that might be, favorably. This is definitely something new in uh, American politics. Uh, a look at some theory and some history can explain this surprising shift, in my view. And it can tell us something about the opportunities for the left in this period. <clears throat> my comments in the spirit of shameless commercialism are based on my recent book, uh, <laughs> titled optimistically, The Rise and Fall of Neoliberal Capitalism, uh, which is available uh, on the usual websites and uh, uh, bookstores, if there are any left. Uh, uh, this book uh, relies on a particular theory of the evolution of capitalist systems, known as social structure of accumulation theory which was developed by uh, Marxist economists in the U.S. starting in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> my interpretation of uh, the uh, situation we're in today uh, rests on the following main points. First, uh, capitalism, a uh, system that's been around for centuries, which is whose uh, most fundamental institutions are uh, the wage labor relation between capitalists and workers and uh, production for exchange and for profits. Uh, capitalism, while it's been around for many centuries, uh, has not always been the same. It has uh, existed in a variety of different institutional forms. Uh, saying that uh, a system uh, is based on wage labor and uh, production for exchange is, is very abstract. It doesn't describe, it's not a very rich description of a society. And capitalism has always had a whole set of additional economic, political, and cultural institutions surrounding it. And uh, these institutions have changed over time, and uh, the change uh, has not been uh, gradual. It's been discrete. Uh, capitalism has existed in particular institutional forms that typically last one decade to several decades. Uh, for the period of its existence, such a form of capitalism uh, promotes profit making and economic expansion, but the contradictions, the problems that always arise uh, as a capitalist economy expands eventually uh, undermine the continued ability of that form of capitalism to any longer promote normal expansion. And when that happens, uh, the system enters uh, a condition uh, known as a structural crisis, a crisis of the particular form of capitalism. And such structural crises have emerged uh, in Europe and in North America in the last uh, uh, 25 years of the 19th century, 18, uh, 1870s to 90s, uh, in the 1930s, in the 1970s, and uh, again today. Uh, second point, neoliberalism. We've had a number of comments about neoliberalism. The term neo neoliberalism is used uh, to mean various different things by different analysts. Uh, in my view, the most useful concept of neoliberalism is a particular form of capitalism. It's an institutional form that arose in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, particularly in uh, the U.S. and the U.K., uh, from which it spread to many other parts of the world. There were actually some somewhat earlier antecedents in uh, some other parts of the world, Chile, for example. Uh, now, why this happened? It was uh, you know no one expected this. Uh, you know, I did my graduate work in economics uh, in the uh, late '60s and early '70s, and we were taught that. Uh, 
free market ideas uh, had been disproved and no one should take them seriously. And what was taught to economics graduate students was that uh, we no longer have a pure capitalism, we have a mixed economy, you know, there's the private sector, there's the state, there's the market, there's also government guidance. Uh, capitalism's a good system, but it only works well if there's a strong state, strong labor unions, progressive income tax, etc. Those were the dominant ideas, and those were the uh, institutions of that period. <coughs> uh, and uh, all of a sudden, in the 70s, this changed, both in the realm of economic institutions and policies and in the dominant ideas. The old free market ideas came roaring back uh, and became dominant very rapidly uh, with a few new wrinkles, but they weren't really uh, different from the pre-Great Depression dominant economic ideas. Uh, you know, why this change occurred is, is a very interesting question. I don't have time to, to go into it. There's one a chapter in my book that, that looks into uh, the evidence. Uh, you know, I had some suspicions about why this radical change occurred from a uh, form of capitalism in which wages and profits rose more or less at the same rate, and wages rose every year. I don't want to make it seem rosy, but uh, it was a lot better than what we have today for workers and suddenly shifted to a system in which uh, profits mushroomed and real wages fell over time. Real wages today in the U.S. are uh, somewhat below what they were in 1980. It's quite remarkable. Uh, and many other trends changed as well. Uh, now, what, what I found was that uh, the great majority of big business in the U.S., and I think something similar happened in many other countries uh, at the end of World War II, a big majority of big business at the end of World War II, for various reasons, supported uh, a, a kind of a social democratic form of capitalism. Not because they liked it, but because they thought it was better than the alternatives that they faced. Uh, uh, and I found all these documents by, uh, put out by the Committee for Economic Development, which was the main uh, big business organization of the U.S. in the late 40s, and they had uh, published documents that said things like uh, uh, workers cannot get uh, fair wages if they are forced to bargain with a large employer themselves. They, they can only do this through collective bargaining. Uh, it said that Social Security uh, should be uh, maintained and expanded. Uh, one of the most revealing statements said that we've learned from the experience of the last, 20, the last 15 years, meaning since the beginning of the 30s, uh, that our economy can be subject to very large swings in output and employment, and we've learned that appropriate government policy can moderate these swings, uh, meaning they supported Keynesian uh, policies of spending and taxing to prevent another Great Depression. And they even said, we must avoid another depression like that which we've just gone through because such events uh, have many costs, and they listed the costs no business failures, unemployment. And they said it may, such events may cause many people to grasp onto uh, superficial solutions that they think will cure all ills, you know, <laughs> socialism. They were worried they were going to lose the whole thing. You know, this, this capitalist mood was captured by a statement from uh, Joseph Kennedy, the father of John F. and Robert Kennedy and Edward Kennedy in the 1930s, uh, who supported the New Deal when he said, I would gladly part with half of my fortune if that's what is necessary to keep the other half. Mm -hmm. He was speaking out of work. never did part with half of his fortune, but you get the idea, you know, okay, you can tax me. Better than not having anything to tax uh, of mine. Uh, well, they changed their position. In the late 40s, uh, big business formed more or less a coalition with uh, organized labor, and that brought uh, the post-war form of capitalism. And it produced uh, the most rapid growth of any long period in capitalist history all over the world. There were similar systems in Western Europe, Japan. Uh, but by, as Al noted, by the late 60s, early 70s, the profit rate was falling. That system empowered the working class in certain ways. And by the late 60s, early 70s, profits were being squeezed by the relatively high degree of bargaining power of labor when the unemployment rate fell very low. And uh, capital turns against the system. And again, I, I read the, the documents of 
the Business Roundtable, which was the major big business organization of the 70s, the 1970s. And in the beginning of the 70s, they were still supporting uh, you know, the old New Deal policies. But by the late 70s, they, had, they shifted and called for supporting the whole Reagan program. OK, I'm still on my second point. Um, I better speed up. Uh, there, there were certain, it wasn't just a falling profit rate. There were certain conjunctural factors. The Great Depression seemed wrong in the past, seemed like an accident. I thought they didn't have to worry about it. Anyway, uh, what followed was a whole wave of changes. Uh, deregulation of business and banking, uh, privatization of public services, cutbacks in social welfare programs, uh, the corporate and government attack on trade unions and collective bargaining. The theme of neoliberal capitalism is marketization. Uh, neoliberalism is not just a policy, it is a coherent set of economic, political, and cultural institutions that all reinforce each other, that fit together, and that are supported by a particular set of ideas. It also embodies, as Al noted, a particular form of the capital-labor relation in which capital strives to completely dominate labor. <clears throat> now, neoliberal capitalism did bring 25 years of relatively stable, if not very vigorous, economic expansion. Uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, of course, also brought an enormous increase in inequality and many other negative social economic phenomena. As long as it was promoting relatively stable expansion, it was very difficult to challenge. Uh, like every form of capitalism, its contradictions eventually caught up with it. And in 2008, that form of capitalism tends to end uh, or give rise to a, a very sudden, sharp structural crisis. Uh, the crisis of 2008 was very much like the crisis of 1929, uh, also a crisis of an earlier liberal for relatively free market form of capitalism. <coughs> uh, uh, so I'm arguing that uh, 2008 marked the end of the phase of neoliberal capitalism when it could promote normal economic expansion. And what we've seen since then is stagnation in the US, in Europe, in Japan, throughout the, the developed capitalist world, which has now spread to the, the less developed parts of the world. <coughs> A structural crisis can be resolved uh, only by major restructuring. This is true of every past structural crisis. The crisis of the late 19th century was resolved only by the rise of big business and finance capital and a more uh, active role for the state, briefly, uh, in regulating the economy. The crisis of the 1930s was resolved by the post-war form of more statist, strong trade union capitalism. Uh, the crisis of the 70s was resolved by the neoliberal transformation. Uh, structural crisis has, in principle, three possible uh, outcomes, continuing stagnation, if there is no restructuring, but I think it's unlikely that that uh, can continue, especially in the US, for very long. Uh, second is restructuring of capitalism, which is not impossible to restructure it so that it would again promote one or several decades of expansion, or passing beyond capitalism. I think this is a possibility in a period such as this. Uh, restructuring within capitalism can take different forms. There's reason to believe that if capitalism is to be restructured, it will uh, be restructured in the direction of a more statist form of capitalism. But there are different types of more statist forms. And we're seeing advocates of those two types now. One is a uh, nationalist, authoritarian form of capitalism. And I think Trump represents that direction of restructuring, which could form a coherent but very uh, unpleasant uh, system. And the second is a more social democratic form of restructuring, which I think is what Bernie Sanders, despite his use of the term socialism, is really calling for. When asked, he says, the New Deal. That's what I'm for. And that'd be uh, a lot better. But uh, it's not uh, what most of us think of as socialism. Now, uh, the, I think there's, there's no laws that can uh, uh, determine what will come next. It's the result of complex struggles among various classes and groups. Uh, but this structural crisis creates the possibility of either radical reform or even transition uh, beyond capitalism. The left has opportunities in this period. Uh, the events of 2008 to 9 significantly delegitimized capitalism. I mean, for decades, people have been told you sink or swim based on your own efforts. And all of a sudden, 
when the big banks were all about to go bankrupt, the taxpayers bailed them out. This had a really big shock effect. I think that's why so many people are now saying, well, if this is capitalism, maybe socialism would be better. I think that's one major reason. Second, there's a growing sense that the system is not working. It's a remarkably widespread sense among the population. And so they're looking for major change, for something different. Uh, third, there has been further intensification of exploitation and oppression, which has been going on since 1980, but it's been intensified since 2008, 2009. Almost all of the additional income generated in the US has gone to the top 1%. It's quite, in the last few years, it's quite remarkable. So this is a period when proposals for major change suddenly can get a serious hearing when they could not previously. Of course, there's also a danger. This is fertile ground for a growing strength of uh, right-wing groups and leaders. And we're seeing this not just in the US, but in many places in the world, in the Philippines, in Austria, in Turkey, in many places. There are right-wing uh, authoritarian nationalist movements, parties, leaders who are emerging. Uh, structural crisis gives rise to political polarization. Uh, I think in this period, the left should boldly demand radical change because uh, if uh, a change that will be in the direction of bringing real benefits for the majority does not emerge, more and more people are going to be attracted to the siren song of nationalism, hatred of the other, etc. Uh, failure to build a growing left in this period uh, which would offer a real solution to the problems people face. It would not just miss an opportunity, it would uh, lead more people, resulting in more people turning to the right with disastrous consequences for all of us. Thank you.